Hey, hey, good morning, church. Good morning. Happy birthday, church. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It is the birthday of the church. It is the day when we remember that the Holy Spirit came down on that first gathering of average, ordinary followers of Jesus and empowered them through a gust of wind and tongues of fire to take up Jesus' mantle and carry on his mission as their 2,000 years of this still been going on, and we are a part of it. Today we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit as the life of the church, and if you are joining us for the first time today, we warmly welcome you. My name is John McAllister, and I have the great privilege of being pastor here at Sunrise Church. There is a lot of wonderful stuff that is happening in our church, and some things that I want you to be aware of coming into the coming weeks and weeks. Uh, first, uh, in a couple weeks, two Sundays from now, it will be Father's Day Sunday. Now, Father's Day Sunday is sort of a big deal here at Sunrise Church. We celebrate it in part by having a men's chorus up here uh, on the stage. So uh, if you are a guy and you can sing, or if you were a guy and you were like me and you can't sing, Four children who are signed up to be a part of our VBS. This is a good thing, and it's also presented us, presented us with a good problem. Uh, so that we don't have so many kids in the same classroom at the same time, we are opening up new classes uh, to teach our kids uh, during the breakout session, the 20-minute breakout session that will happen each of the three nights, uh, where we, uh, we kind of have the singing in here, we have sort of like the big lesson in here, and then when we break out into smaller groups, we go a little bit more in-depth to talk about the Bible story that we are focusing on on that given night. We need a few more people to help teach our children about Jesus uh, when we get into Vacation Bible School for a simple 20-minute lesson. Anybody can do it. If you are interested, if that is something that you think that you would like even more information about, I invite you to contact Karen Manis, who is our Director of Children's Ministries, and she will be glad to share more about it. VBS is fun. It is a wonderful time. The noise and the laughter of children is going to fill this place, kind of like that first Pentecost. Instead of uh, uh, rushing of wind and tongues of fire, it will be lots of jumping up and down and lots of giggling voices, and that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, there are lots of good things that are coming up in the life of our church. I invite you to check out our Facebook page. I also invite you to, to sign up for our, our weekly newsletter if you want more information about what's going on here at Sunrise Church. And if you have any questions, you are also welcome to contact me directly, and I will be glad to share. Welcome to church, friends. Welcome to worship. As we begin this morning, can we start off in prayer? Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Set our hearts on fire this hour. Come, Holy Spirit, come and help us to worship you this day as we celebrate your coming into our world and into our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And help us to lay aside those things that call on our attention that will be there when we get home. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And help us to be here now. That as we worship and as we celebrate, you might give glory to God and that we might find strength for our living that you give to us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We ask these things now in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen.
I invite you to stand for our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship this Pentecost Sunday comes from Psalm 104. This is a responsive reading. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you were very great. O Lord, how wonderful are your works. In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's continue in worship by singing and worshiping with number 475, Come Down, O Love Divine. We will do all three verses. Let us join together our voices in this opening prayer. Will you pray with me? Almighty, Almighty God, God, you, you open the, the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the, the promised promise gift of your, of your Holy Spirit, Spirit that all may be welcomed and made as one family in Jesus Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us this day and set our hearts on fire that we may share the gospel by our words and deeds and invite others to your loving embrace, giving glory to you through Christ our Savior. Amen. Christ came into our world and into our lives to offer us that which the world cannot, a peace that passes all understanding, everlasting life, and a strength and a power for living that comes from God himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. The peace of Christ be with you, church. And also with you. Take a moment this morning and greet your neighbor in Christ's peace.
Every Sunday morning as part of the rhythm of our worship, we take time to go to God in prayer, lifting up our joys and our concerns, knowing that when we go to God, God is the one who draws near to us, who hears our prayers, and who responds to our needs. This morning as we go to God in prayer, we uh, lift up uh, Lori Linfante and David Holm and Ashley Holm this day uh, after we had the funeral for Lori's mother, Mary Lou Gorgol, yesterday uh, here in the sanctuary. We lift up the Linfante and the Gorgol families this day, praying for peace, praying for comfort. We lift up David Floyd this day, who is in the hospital over at Rex Hospital uh, with the health challenges that he continues to live with. We lift up Franklin Floyd as he prepares for a kidney transplant, and we pray for peace and for healing and for uh, God's steadfast presence throughout all of this time in their lives. We lift up our buddy Bob Mustin, uh, who continues to take chemotherapy treatments. Bob, we love you, and we are praying for you in these days. Are there other concerns we want to lift up to the Lord this morning? Yes, ma'am. So we lift up Mrs. Francis this morning, pray for her healing. Are there others? Yes, ma'am. So we lift up Kathy this morning. We pray for peace and for mercy and for uh, uh, peace in this time of her life, in this uh, transition time in her life other concerns this morning. Friends, if you were joining us on Facebook this morning, we also invite you to write in your joys or concerns online. Yes, ma'am. Remind us of her first name again, Marla. So we lift up Carol this morning. Okay. When we come into God's house, we also come in with praise and with thanksgiving. And this morning we give thanks to God with Sue Black, who is somewhere in this room for the birth of of a new grandbaby, Miss Madeline Claire was born on May 12th, and I saw pictures of that youngin. She's showing pictures of that youngin in the back of the church right now. Thanks be to God for uh, for the the joy of a new baby uh, in uh, in your family. I give thanks to God. Yesterday uh, we've got a picture of this. Uh, yesterday there were uh, 35 folks from sort of our, our uh, the the young families who are part of Sunrise Church. Uh, who gathered over at Howling Cow Ice Cream uh, over uh, off of Lake Wheeler Road. And any time you can get together with, uh, over ice cream with some friends and uh, throw some cows in the mix, uh, it is a good day indeed. So uh, we give thanks to God for that wonderful time yesterday. We had 35 folks come out yesterday, and I think Mark's got a, a picture of it we want to throw up there. We had 35 folks who came out yesterday. That's a, a uh, children and and and, uh, and adults alike, and that that is that is that is just uh, that's about one third uh, of the young adults, the young families uh, that are part of Sunrise Church, uh, that are active in the life of our congregation right now. And I give thanks to God for that. That is a good and beautiful and joy filled thing indeed. What else do we give thanks to God for this day, Church? Yes, sir. For friends who are in town, we give thanks and praise. Welcome again. Others? Yes, ma'am. Going to first grade. All right. Way to go, Miss Audrey, for this beautiful day indeed. Other joys this morning. We praise God for where you are right now, Mr. Bob, and we are praying that you stay on this good course and that God continues to strengthen you and bless you. We love you. All right, let's lift these up. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of this good day and for all of the good things that you are doing uh, through this congregation that we call Sunrise Church. God, we give you thanks for the wonderful music of handbells and for the wonderful voices of a congregation gathered together from different places 
from different backgrounds here in one place to sing your praise. God, just as you moved through that first meeting place of the first church with a gust of wind and tongues of flame, we know because we have experienced in our own lives that you are still at work in this world. And yet, God, you call us, you invite us into your home. You invite us to lay our concerns, our needs at the foot of your throne, at the foot of your altar, trusting in you. So, God, you have heard those names that we have lifted aloud this morning. You have heard the concerns that we have in our lives, some of which we have spoken aloud. But, God, we give you thanks that when words fail us, your spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. So, God, we take a moment in silence now just to lift up to you the needs of our hearts. We thank you that you are a God who loves us beyond our understanding. We thank you for that you are a God that you have come down to us and that you have promised to be with us and that you have promised to give us a strength when our strength runs out that we might face whatever challenges we have in life and face them with the confidence that we will not be alone. Thank you, God. We give you thanks for all of these things through Christ Jesus our Lord who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I received an email earlier this week. It was a sort of broadcast email from the United Methodist Committee on Relief. That is our disaster relief arm of the United Methodist Church. And it was talking about the most recent $10 million distribution that has gone uh, in part to uh, churches in local areas in Ukraine that are helping families who have been affected by the war there, that has gone to churches that have become uh, staging areas to receive refugees to support these folks as they are coming across the border fleeing from a war-torn area. And and also monies that have gone to Sierra Leone and countries in West Africa to improve child and maternal health. You have helped to make that possible. You have helped to have that kind of impact. Thank you for your gifts, church, that strengthen our missions and our ministries here locally within the walls of this church and within the borders of Apex, Holly Springs, and Fuquay Verena. But thank you for your gifts that also strengthen our missions and our ministries that we might have an impact for Jesus far beyond this community. If you have brought a gift for the Lord this morning, I invite you to leave it in the container in the back before you go. Thank you, church.
there are children who are going to children's church, I invite them to come and huddle with me for a prayer before they go. All right, guys. All right, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of all of the children of our church, especially these who are here before you now. God, we love them so much, and we know that you love them far more than even we do. Bless them as they go to children's church, and bless us as we stay in big people's church. Help us to learn a little bit more about Jesus, and help us to become a little bit more like him. We ask these things in his holy name, and all God's people said, amen. All right, you guys are free to go with Miss Laria and Miss Angie. So in between the transition between the early service and the and this service, uh, my 16-point font um, printout of the scripture reading uh, has left the pulpit. So I'm going to be reading from this small version. So I invite you to hear now these words, but also uh, bear with me uh, as I read this small print. Uh, our first reading this morning from scripture is from Genesis chapter 11. This is the story of the Tower of Babel. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand each other's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Our second reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who were speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, 
that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious and merciful are you, O God, and abounding in steadfast love. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing unto you. And Lord, I ask that you speak with me and through me, but if need be, speak in spite of me. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. One of the things I love about the Bible is that while so many of its stories are breathtakingly beautiful and profound, like the Psalms, or the parables of Jesus. At the same time, so many of its stories are unapologetically weird. And while we can argue about which stories in the Bible are the weirdest, like Balaam and the talking donkey in Numbers, or Jonah getting swallowed by a well and living to tell about it, these two stories today are right up toward the top. In Genesis, we read the story of Babel, of God confusing the people's languages and of their language and their plans, making them unable to understand each other by giving them different languages. And then with Pentecost and Acts, we have the same God coming down with a rush of wind and tongues of fire enabling the people to hear and understand each other, despite the fact that they speak different languages and come from different places. Not only are these stories strange, but they each have an opposite outcome. They are mirror opposites of each other, but both are caused by the same God. Why? Why do we find these very opposite stories in the same book caused by the same God? It begs the question, what is it that God wants for us? To be separate and doing our own things, like in Genesis? Or to be together with unity and comprehension, like in Acts? Another way of asking that question is, what was so wrong at Babel that suddenly became right at Pentecost? What was so wrong at Babel that suddenly became right at Pentecost? If we can answer that question, how might it help us understand God's work and God's will for our lives? How might it help us understand how we are to live in the world as disciples of Jesus? Anthropologists will tell us that every civilization has an origin story. Every culture wants to know where we came from and why things are the way they are. The Hebrew people were no exception. Genesis 11 is their attempt to explain why there are so many different people groups and nations and languages. But for Jews and Christians... It's more than just an attempt to explain the reason why there are different languages and cultures. There is a truth there that is telling and real. The stories in Genesis are all a variation of the same theme. The same consistent theme. From Adam through Joseph, it's the same theme. God creates or recreates, and things are good and abundant, but it's not enough. 
And it's not just that the people want more than they have. They want to strive to be something that they cannot be. Namely God. They try to displace God and things fall apart. Now hear me, the self is not a bad thing. We are made in God's image. The will isn't a bad thing either. Being made in God's image means that we have certain capacities for love and for reason and for will. Both the self and the will are reflections of God. But a self-will run riot is a different thing. It is an unsustainable thing because it displaces and, and it will destroy, if necessary, anything that stands in its way of becoming God, of becoming its own God. This is the problem of sin in a nutshell. The self becomes an idol. It's the self above all things at any cost. And when the self-will run riot happens on a larger scale, on the societal scale, the impacts are greater. Come, the people say, let us build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches into the heavens. Why? To help improve the lives of our neighbors and our children? No. Why? To give glory to God? No. Why? So that we can make a name for ourselves. Huh. So that we can make a name for ourselves. This building up into the heavens isn't about getting closer to God or better serving their friends and their neighbors and their children. Uh uh-uh. uh. It's about the ego. It's about the ego. And God sees this and says, Whoa. If as one people with one language they have begun to do this, then nothing will be impossible for them. Nothing will be impossible for them. Now we're talking about opposites uh, in this sermon, and, and if that phrase sounds familiar, nothing will be impossible, that's because you've heard it before. You hear it in December as we are moving toward Christmas and we hear the story of the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and saying that she is going to be the mother of Jesus. And Mary is like, how in the world am I going to be the mother of Jesus? And the angel Gabriel says to her, Mary, nothing will be impossible for God. Nothing will be impossible for God. God makes the command decision to confuse the people's language And you know what happens when people are confused, right? It's an ego check. You have to admit that you don't know it all. You have to concede that you need help. You actually have to ask for some help. You have to live with some humility, whether you want to or not. Humility appears to be an essential ingredient for the way God wants us to live in the Bible, especially For we who are trying to imitate Jesus, who Philippians tells us, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, he humbled himself. Humility is the opposite of the self-will run riot. That's all well and good, But there's still this issue of God separating one people through confusion of different languages in in Genesis 11. And then God bringing people together in unity and comprehension despite different languages at Pentecost. Is God contradicting himself? I don't think so. Because when you think about it, exact opposites can be equally faithful depending on the context, depending on the timing. Take rest, for example. God is so concerned about our well-being that he actually commands us to take a day of rest every single week. Take a day off every single week because rest is vital. A day of rest is essential to a good life. 
So for me, I mean, I think like a perfect Sabbath might look something like getting to sleep in late, maybe rolling out to a late brunch or an early lunch, hanging out with some friends in the afternoon, then maybe like kicking back on the couch and maybe watching some basketball or maybe the back of my eyelids. Now, to me, that's a great way to spend a Saturday or a Sunday, but maybe not a Tuesday, right? Timing is important. Think about it if you are planting something. You're planting roses. There is a time to to plant the seed and to water it and to fertilize it and to nurture it to help it grow. But in a few years, once the seed has turned into a plant and the plant has become a big bush, if you want the rose bush to thrive, there will be a time when you need to prune it back. And the same act done at different times can either propel or impede. It can either hurt or heal. The timing and the context matters, right? Does this make sense? Say yes. <laughs> what matters is the timing and the context which makes all the difference when we are looking at Babel and looking at Pentecost. At Babel, the people were working out of egocentric motives. Superficially for recognition, let us make a name for ourselves, but really for power. At Pentecost, the context is entirely different. By the time we get to Acts, the people in this story had experienced God in the flesh on their level, in their lives. God had come down to the plain of Shinar of their lives in Jesus, who met them at the place of their greatest need, who met them at the place of their deepest longings, who gave himself up for them, and who modeled for them a way of being in the world that was good and true and fulfilling and right. It was a way that was grounded first in the trust of God. God was at the center, not the ego. And when you love God first, you can love everything else rightly. If you love God first, you can love everything and everyone else rightly. Not only that, but these people in Acts... You know, they had gone through some stuff. They had witnessed crucifixion and resurrection. They had known deep pain and great fear, and they had watched firsthand the power of God to overcome these things. These people's lives had been through the ringer, but they had lived to tell about it. And they were a different people on the other side. Because they knew something of the power of God and they knew something about their own limitations. They had had time to connect the dots in Scripture to understand how Jesus' life was unfurled from Scripture and how their lives were now part of Jesus' life and Jesus' story. The Holy Spirit comes down just as Jesus promised. Not in a way that they could have expected or predicted because you cannot control the Spirit. It goes wherever it will. You cannot control the wind. But you can't adjust your sails, right? You cannot, you cannot control the Spirit, but you can partner with it. It's important to catch what happens after the Spirit comes and Babel is undone. When through the rush of wind and flames of people of different languages can hear each other and understand each other, Peter, of all people, the one in the Gospels who is more apt to put his foot in his mouth than anybody else, he gets up to proclaim the story of what God has done in Jesus. How Jesus defeated death, as Peter would say, because it was impossible for death to keep its power on him. Peter tells them the same God who raised Jesus from the dead is the same God who has promised to save us and redeem us from the power of sin and death. And that promise is, to quote Peter, quote, is for you, for your children, 
for people who are far away and anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. The people hear this and they say, well, what do we need to do to be saved, they ask. Repent, Peter says. That is, to turn around from your selfish ways. To place your trust in God, your hope in Jesus, to be baptized, water-washed, and spirit-born into this new life with God at the center. And with God at the center, everything else that matters will fall into place. And 3,000 people said, I'm in. I want it. You've heard me say this a bunch. But at the end of the day, the Bible isn't a bunch of stories bound up in a book. But really, one story told again and again and again across a thousand year span. And here we are, 3,000 years after the Bible's origins, and for me, 20 years into this gig, and I can tell you that the story is true, and it is still going. There is this theme that I have seen lived out so consistently now that you cannot convince me otherwise. In the Bible, there are these times where we read about people going through life and something falls apart and it looks like darkness is going to win out. But God steps in in a way that only God can and it changes the story altogether. When they send you off to seminary and you have to read about Christian history, all of the people who shaped our understanding of faith, all of them, From St. Paul in the Bible to people like St. Augustine and St. Francis and Martin Luther and John Wesley, all of them believed in God on some mental level, some cognitive level. They believed that there was a benevolent creator of the universe. But then something happens in their life. Something breaks. Some tragedy happens. Their ego gets busted. And they're at the end of their ropes and their world has fallen apart. And God is no longer this sort of luxury to believe in. No longer this sort of mere intellectual pursuit. They need help. And when all else has failed, there's God. I could tell you six dozen stories. Just from my privileged vantage point that I've got by virtue of my vocation, the privilege of getting to walk with people through some hard stuff in life. The loss of a job, the breakup of a marriage, a scary diagnosis, addiction and recovery, the death of a loved one, Folks whose lives get thrown for a loop and they are facing darkness and fear. They are facing pain and brokenness. And they turn to God sometimes because God's the only one left. And it turns out that when you're at the end of the rope, huh, that's where God lives. In darkness and infirmity and even into death, even then, guess who's there? You want to hear some good news? You want to hear some good news? There is a power that is not of this world, that is yet present in this world, that is accessible and available to anybody in this world. There is a power not of this world, that is yet in this world, and that is accessible to anybody in the world. The difference between Babel and Pentecost is that when Peter got up to speak on behalf of that otherwise ordinary group of people that we called the first church, he wasn't saying, hey, let's go make a name for ourselves. He got up and he basically said, hey, let me tell you about what God has done and about what God is doing and about what God can do. This time, God is at the center and others are the focus. The self, meanwhile, is taken care of and empowered 
because it trusts in God above all things. Peter speaks from this place of authentic experience as his authentic self, and he spoke from that place and got out the way. And God changed thousands of people's lives because of it. It was such an impact that 2,000 years later, we are still talking about it, and many of us are experiencing it in our own lives. There is a higher power that can strengthen us for all things. There is a higher power that can give us a strength that we cannot find anywhere else in this world. There is a higher power that can give us a strength for living and a strength to face whatever life may throw at us. And that power that we call the Holy Spirit can also do a world of good in us and through us if we're willing. Turns out that willingness, which is related to humility, is the only thing God needs. In Peter's own words, that promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away and for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news indeed. Amen? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace and fellowship with one another. So as we prepare our hearts to come to this Christ's table, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Glory to to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, you humbled yourself yourself and you came down to earth And you knelt by the silt of the river and you formed us out of the clay of the earth. And you breathed into us the power of your own Holy Spirit to give us life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You pursued us even into slavery and captivity. You delivered us from slavery to captivity and promised to be with us, our God, always forever. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven... We praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. You promised that your Holy Spirit would come upon your church to do things that they could not even dream or imagine, and 2,000 years later, it is still happening. We give you thanks and praise that you have incorporated us into these mighty acts, O Lord. By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, the same night that he promised us the Holy Spirit, He took bread, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, O Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for this world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, Lord, make us one. One with Jesus, one with one another, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in heavenly victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The bread which we break, we believe, is the sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks, we believe, is the sharing in the blood of Christ. If you have never uh, been to a service at sunrise where we've celebrated communion before, we, we are a Methodist people. We, we, uh, we celebrate an open table. Which is to say this, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like, or where you are on the journey of faith and doubt. When we read scripture, there is nobody who wanted to have a meal with Jesus who was turned away, and the same is true here. This table may live at 5420 Sunset Lake Road, but it does not belong to Sunrise United Methodist Church. This table belongs to Jesus, and at his table, everybody's welcome. You are welcome to receive communion today by intention, which is to say you can come forward if you want. You'll be given a piece of bread. You can take the bread, dip it in the cup, and receive the elements in that fashion. Or if you feel more comfortable taking communion uh, by the little communion MREs that we have in the basket in the back, you are welcome to take, to take communion that way. I'm going to need some help this morning. If there are uh, three people who can come and help me serve, that would be, that'd be absolutely fantastic. Here goes, sir. And we will let children come first as they come in with the sound of Pentecost. (laughs) (laughs) And all are welcome. Come and taste. The Lord is good. Come on, guys, you come first.
pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Right, we stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 393, it's Spirit of the Living God. We'll sing it two times.